Hey there, this is Matt once again. Sorry for the delay. Just wanted to get things set up as I've got another request, this time from Peter, who wanted a commentary on the 1990 film Darkman. So, thank you for that. I very much appreciate it. For those interested, feel free to send requests either directly to my PayPal or join my Patreon. Both things are down below in the info box. I will admit, right off the bat, I'm not good with commentaries. That's just the, the fact. I am not good with commentaries. There's a lot of dead air because I didn't work on the film. So I don't really know what else to say, but I'll do my best. <clears throat> so let's get to a 3 2 1 pressing play. As we have the kind of cool Universal logo where it goes through the different years, the different types of Universal Pictures logos. Before going to pulling back from the the Earth, and then the Universal logo going here. Again, I thought that was always interesting. That's the anniversary seventy fifth, was it? Yeah, seventy fifth anniversary. But uh, then we have Universal Pictures presents for sinking issue, uh, sinking. Renaissance Pictures, <coughs> Renaissance Man, the Renaissance Man. So, of course, this is directed by Sam Raimi, who is a comic book fan. And I know he wanted to do, at one point, Batman. He wanted to do The Shadow and... They would not let him do either. So he's like, okay, I'll create my own comic book type of character that became Dark Man. I guess during the making of the film, or at least post production, there's a lot of issues dealing with the editing. So I'm not really even sure what Sam Raimi thinks about it. If he's unhappy because he didn't get the edit he wanted, or what the whole deal is. I know originally they wanted Bruce Campbell to be. Dark Man, but Universal others are like, oh, I don't know, he's not really a baitable star Bill Paxton was up for it he really wanted it I think he told his buddy Liam Neeson, and then Bill Paxton got pissed at Liam Neeson that he got the job now, of course here you have your collection of villains you got Durant of course we have this guy here who was in a, the guy with the bald head, he was the star of the film Don't Answer the Phone, fairly sleazy film from the early 80s. He also have, he was also in Swamp Thing, the Wes Craven film. You have the one guy who has the fake leg, uh, sadly he's passed away, but I did the guy with the fake leg who uses as a machine gun, I think that's Danny Hicks? Sadly, he's passed away. May he rest in peace. He was the redneck in Evil Dead 2. We yell, Bobby Joe! He was also the... He was also in the slasher film Intruder. <clears throat> of course, you have Ted Raimi on there. Sam Raimi's brother. Yeah, there's, da there's Danny Hicks. The bum leg. <clears throat> I think this guy talked in, I think he was in Press of Darkness, the John Carpenter film. <coughs> and Sam Raimi definitely had a bit of a style. <coughs> Anytime you talk about Sam Raimi, they always talk about uh, his style. And you see here, like, the push-ins, at one point following the gun here. And, yeah, the, I forgot what rating this film got. Was it PG-13 or was it R? I can't remember what rating this got. Oh, uh, you saw the dummy there get hit by the car. 
Victor on here is a definitely a good shot. <coughs> I think this is the first film he ever dealt with action. I mean, there's a little bit of action in Evil Dead films, but I mean, actual action before, of course, the Spider-Man films. Ah, uh, the cigarette lighter. Little motif for the villain. Which you don't use that, of course, for other other means. <coughs> Larry Drake, he plays Durant. And he did a great job. <laughs> He just has a lot of, I'm sorry, I'm just watching it now. I love this bit here. I got seven more points. <laughs> I see he's going to cut seven more fingers. <clears throat> just shows how down and dirty Larry Drake is of the villain. Fresh is a bit dormant, apparently her and Sam Raimi did not deal long during the making of the film. I apologize for the clearing of my throat. It's just like my throat just dry very easily. <coughs> so I, I, I apologize for the clearing of my throat. Danny Elfman, of course, who did the score for Batman, worked with Sam Raimi quite a few times. Some of the Spider-Man films, among others. I remember the marketing campaign for this film, Who is Darkman? And they used music from, I want to say, Brainstorm, the film Brainstorm, the trailer. I actually quite like the trailer and the TV spots. You know, the music in that. Da -da -da -da. Chut Ferrer, the screenplay, that's the same guy who would write Hard Target. And Sarah Raimi had a deal with Universal at the time, that's why... I think he directed Army Universal. He directed this. Also, he would produce... Sam Raimi would produce Hard Target and Time Cop. And they say, okay, we want you to produce it. Just in case John Woo doesn't work out. And then Sam Raimi is like, well, that's ridiculous. John Woo's easily going to work out. But Sam Raimi's name is on there as producer as well as Robert Tappert. With part of their deal with Universal. I think this did make a bit of money. I mean it was a blockbuster like Batman. But it made a little bit of money. I mean enough that they made you know, two direct to video sequels. Which sadly Liam Neeson did not return. And I'm sorry. Arno Vosloo. He works in, in roles like that. But him as the lead. Eh. Not really my, my favorite. Just my opinion on it. Because we have the whole idea of trying to regenerate skin. It is, you know, for burn victims and things of that nature. But Liam Neeson, at this point, he had not done a lot of movies like this. I mean, more maybe dramatic work. He had a bit, you know, supporting role in a film like Kroll. But, oh, he was in the Patrick Swayze film Next of Ten. But it's not a lot of films he got the star in like this. And he seems proud of the film. He did a, granted it was a short interview, but he did an interview on the Stream Factory Blu-ray. Said he liked the challenge, he liked the sort of fan to the opera, almost aspect of the challenge of this character, working with Sam Raimi. 
And of course, he would definitely lead into much more action oriented roles later in his career. Tate did nonstop, all that stuff. <coughs> and Liam Neeson is definitely one of the reasons that makes this that this film works, in my opinion. And I do think he's a good actor. At first, a bit dormant. I think she got cast. She was, I think, maybe still married. At least she was at the time. To one of the Cohen brothers. And I did apparently her and Sam Raimi did not get along making the film. That they had arguments on the script or something of that nature. I wouldn't be surprised if it was something like, well, I don't want to be too much of a damsel in distress. I don't want to be too much of just a dumb bimbo type of character. But yeah, no, like I said, Sam Raimi wanted to do more of a, he wanted to do The Shadow, he didn't get that. Of course, that's going to come into play later, that coffee ring, the nose of a certain piece of paper much later on. Just put your feet on her, yeah, just I don't put my feet all over you. Oh those shoes are very clean. Don't know. I guess to be honest with me, I'm not really much of a riffer. Like, I don't riff on movies if I do like them. I I don't know, I'm just... A lot of people do, like, even if they like the film, they make fun of it. This, I don't really do that a whole lot. <clears throat> now, if it's a movie that sucks, I'll be riffing all day long. So maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm better at movies that are shitty, but... I think because, you know, a lot of people nowadays, it's like they don't want to admit they like a movie or they like a movie, but it's like, well, I can't like it too much, otherwise I'll be a non-intellectual. Because they wanted to get married and... And this is, I guess, sort of our main villain in the movie. I do think that's one of the few issues I have with the film is... I don't think this guy is that strong of a villain. I really don't. And the fact that Larry Drake's character just commands the screen a lot more he should have just been the the final villain at the end not this guy i mean when dark man is fighting the guy and the high rise when it's not constructed yet that should have been larry dre it should have been this guy like this guy i don't give a shit about <laughs> i'm sorry i just don't give a shit about this guy i don't know if it's the actor i don't know if it's the way he's written Maybe it's the actor, just... Maybe it's both. But yeah, Larry Drake just makes that much more of an impression. And then he dies, it's like, oh, okay, now we got the rest of the movie. Like, the ending works because the style. Like, the point of view, shooting the bolt into Darkman's hand. And then his old going crazy and taking it. You know, the the style works a lot to make that scene successful. 
But this guy, I don't give a shit about. I don't give a shit about his suit. I don't give a shit about his tie. I don't give a shit about his face. I don't give a shit about his voice. I don't give a shit about his stupid haircut. I don't give a shit about him. So technically Liam Neeson got killed because of his wife, or his girlfriend, I should say. <coughs> it's his girlfriend's fault. Because <laughs> he had absolutely nothing to do with this. He's complete innocent. <laughs> Pretty much finding out that the cells of the face skin gets better in the dark. Although I don't know if they really do much more with this light thing, like it's, it deals with light. I don't know if they really do much more with, with all that. In a really cool direction with the low camera and the reveal of some of these characters. And then different angles. <laughs> Was this guy trying to do martial arts? His assistant? He got like a martial arts day and didn't work. Now see, if this is the Liam Neeson from Tate, and he would take all these guys out in a second. <coughs> which, which is true, he doesn't know what they're talking about, so that's what I mean, he's completely in his sense. <coughs> Again, pretty cool direction. Having the camera right in the <coughs> the cabinets, but kind of a uh, oh, what's his director's name? Kind of a Scott Speedo moment. The Scott Speedo is a director that would have weird POV in this case in the cabinet as the face just smashed in. Yeah, these guys, you definitely have no sympathy for when Dark Man takes care of them. <clears throat> okay, this was rated R. Alright. Kind of surprised it wasn't bloodier then. Maybe it's one of those things they attempted to get PG-13, but no matter what they did, they are rated R. Ew. That's pretty good the stuntman having your arms on fire. Done for real, done for practical. Also for Liam Neeson, like you have to put your face in there looking like you're getting you're being drowned. It's not an easy thing to do. I mean, for anyone out there, you guys try it. Or do you dunk your face in? You got a little like you're being drowned. You open your mouth so the liquid is getting in there. Yeah, not the easiest thing to do. But how do you do that and not, you know, be choking on water?
Uh, that little birdie thing. That definitely comes into play later on. I kind of like a lot of those the pulp comics back in the day. You have a tragic origin for your hero. You know, some event that leads into him becoming this figure, anti-hero, vigilante, however you want to put it. Ah, oh, she's dressed in black. That's appropriate for what's going to happen next. <laughs> You figure Frisbee Bedorian would have a clue as to what happened when previously she just had someone warn her about Robert Durant. It's like, hmm, someone warned me that this crime boss may be looking for me. And then the, the next night, my fucking boyfriend's place gets blown up. And I always thought this was a cool shot when the body flies out. I you know how they did that. That just looks really cool. It's like a shooting star. You like a shooting star. Just shot right there like a slingshot. <laughs> There's a little bit of a clunky effect. Doesn't really hold up well. The transition from there to the grave. Yard. <laughs> but, uh, just look up some trivia. Liam Neeson worked 18 hour days and 10 piece makeup. They liked the challenge. Director Sam Raimi wanted Bruce Campbell to play the lead, but producers were uncertain that Campbell could handle it. But he does make a small cameo in, at the end. Wanted to do the show, but he couldn't get the rights to it. <coughs> Worked with Danny Elfman worked with Sam Raimi in quite a few projects, including Spider-Man. Partnership ended with Spider-Man 2 due to creative differences, but they would reunite, however, for Oz, the Great and Powerful. <coughs> Apparently, the editor had a nervous breakdown, left the production. No details as to why that really came to be. Julie, Julie Roberts was almost cast as Julie before she got Pretty Woman, and then you got Frances McDormand. Oh, this direct, this, uh, this lady here is Jenny Agutter from An American Wolf in London. I guess apparently Kathy Bates was going to be this role, and then backed out before filming. And then you've got Jenny Agutter to play this. Who pretty much describes the dark man. No, uh, well, no pain. <clears throat> and also takes a little bit of how he could get super strength, honestly. Especially these fits of rage. Fits of uncontrollable rage. Sam Raimi also wanted to pay homage to the Universal Horror Films in the 1930s. Makes sense. This came out in the summer of 1990. And these fits of rage are pretty cool visual look to it they definitely <laughs> bring the create creativity juices flowing 
that's why you can implement rage fueled like these little hallucinations that really elevate the rage but then they definitely stand out where you can just go free in creativity with those Yeah, he's a bit fucked up. <laughs> he's a bit fucked up. Looking like the mummy. <laughs> when you're cold as shit here, you don't get pneumonia. You better get inside, man. You better get the fuck inside. Fuck the splashing water on them too. Yeah, Shane don't recognize who, buddy. Shane don't recognize you at all. <laughs> He couldn't even say anything. <clears throat> Farzad Bador certainly didn't want to help him. <laughs> Not good Samaritan, are you, man? Not good Samaritan at all. I see this guy looking like he's ready, been run over by a lawnmower. I'm not going to help him. Fuck it. <laughs> I got my umbrella. I'm getting the fuck out of here. I could fucking lay there with a bunch of fucking water splash on me. I'm like, nope, I'm getting up right now. He's just laying there, just taking it. Take it like a man, just Liam Neeson. When you take his face, he take your life. If you take his daughter, he'll take your life. When you take his plane ticket, he'll take your life. When you take his train ticket, he'll take your life. See, now you gotta go to Beverly Hills and get some facelifts and bow tots, you'll be right as rain. Clean that shit all you want, it ain't gonna work, buddy. It's a really tiny TV, too. Well, it's a monitor, to be honest, to be fair. Uh, you don't want to do that, man. Don't look at yourself. Believe me. You're going to hate yourself in the morning. I makes me think of Joker. You know, the mirror. You see the mirror. You don't want to see the mirror. Believe me. I'm wondering how he's going to get food. Like, where the hell does he get food? Does he steal food? Does he just eat rats? Like, how does he get food? He must be hungry by this point. Pretty cool lair. Like, the way it's lit. Kind of like an 80s music video, but... <laughs> that's a good thing, actually. Even got a fan. Did a nice camera work, pulling back to showcase the whole environment, get a sense of location. Which should be utilized later on in some action scenes when the bad guys infiltrate the lair and he blows the whole thing the kingdom come. Pretty cool. 
Nice bit there with the light coming from the ceiling. Definite Phantom of the Opera vibes. I think that cat grows to like him later. He definitely knows how to build some shit. Makes sense. He's a scientist. He should know how to build some shit. Let's see if I can look up some more info on the film. Some that just standing, staring blankly at the screen. So the fuck are we watching this for? We can't, you know. I never, it's always weird, like, we say Batman, right? Like, how did Batman get all that shit into the Batcave? Like, did he do it himself? Did him and Alfred do it by themselves? Wouldn't he have to get some, what, contractors or people who own this machinery and shit? Then wouldn't it be like, where the hell am I delivering it to? This cave? Huh, there's this guy named the Batman, and that's weird. I remember delivering all this high-tech gear... And computers to this one cave. Hey, this guy named Bruce Wayne paid me. Hmm, I wonder there's a connection. That's never explained in Batman, I don't think. Is it? Like, he has, like, computers as big as a room. And, like, did, did him and Alfred do it by themselves? Or, like, they moved it there and heavy lifted? Like, how the hell do, do they do that? I just hear it's like he just got spare parts from his lab. I don't know how the fuck he gets that computer working. You fuck a cough on a computer fucks up nowadays, but this lived through a fucking explosion and the monitor still works. That's pretty good. Was it IBM? Shit. It was pretty impressive. Little montage here. Oh yeah, back to the day when you had montages. I love montages. I'm a sucker for them. Especially here with like the weird ways of just having things float back and forth. Definitely gives a more unique feel to it. Compared to a typical, I don't know comic book movie, however you want to call it. You see Bill Pope did the cinematography. Uh, Bill Pope, he's worked on Army of Darkness, Fire in the Sky, Clueless, and The Matrix. He later would do the, the Matrix movies. So there you go. Let's see. Oh, I should get mentioned to Tony Gardner who did the makeup. I mean, Tony Gardner, I think he got first started in... Well, one of his early work was the Blob remake from 1988. He also worked on The Adams Family... He worked a bit on, let's see, Zombieland. There's something about Mary. Yeah, you did guess what the hell it was. There's something about Mary. Oh, he worked on Freaky. I did, okay, makeup effects design on Freaky. That's cool. I just reviewed that recently. That's some pretty good effects. Oh, Tony Gardner, that's pretty cool.
Apparently the film grows 49 million worldwide. Which doesn't sound like a whole lot. I mean, 49 million doesn't sound like a ton. But... You know, I guess back to the day... Back to the day... A film did not need to cross a hundred million dollars and then... Oh, that was a hit. That's not even the case nowadays. If a film grows a hundred million, it'd just still be a flop. <laughs> Wasn't really like that back then, though. <laughs> I did some pretty cool directorial style choices. It's when he recognizes each person, sort of this combination of and also the music that la 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 <laughs> let's see Ron Tomatoes 84% gruesome deliciously broad Sam Raimi's dark band bears the haunted soulfulness of gothic tragedy and the stylistic verve of onomatopoeia spreading off a comic strip page Although audiences pulled by Cinema Store gave it a C plus, so probably audiences were not big on it at the time. I'd have to ask my friend Michael CP. I wonder what the deal is with that Cinema Store C plus. I mean, yeah, this is a pretty crazy idea. Obviously, you don't have to have a dummy. But even shots like here basically go like how they did this. Yeah, and I'm sure if you really show that, it would be like rated Fs or something. NC-17. Filmed out two thumbs up from Cisco and Ebert. They both remarked how original and stylized Raimi's sense of direction was. Gene Cisco added that Dartman as a character was interesting. So it did get two thumbs up from Cisco and Ebert. Huh. Interesting. Let's see. It became the story of a man who lost his face and had to take on other faces. A man who battled criminals using this power. He was working on this idea, I guess, in the 80s. In 1987, Raimi submitted the treatment to Universal Pictures. Suggested that he get a screenwriter to flesh out the story. See. Sorry, I'm just looking up some info on it. I apologize for that. The director had a problem with the editor that the studio assigned him, and eight weeks into assembling the rough cut, he was not following Raimi's storyboards. The editor had a nervous breakdown and left. Early preview streamings did not go well as people laughed in the wrong places and complained about a lack of a happy ending. Universal told Raimi that some people rated Dartman the worst they had ever seen. According to executives, the film was one of the worst storing pictures in Universal's history. Then two preview streamings two, then two preview screenings, one with Danny Elfman's score, went well. Tapper remembers the experience on Dartman was very difficult for Sam and me. It isn't the picture we thought it should be based on the footage we shot and all that. Steel got nervous about some kind of wild things in it, made us take them out, which was unfortunate. Although they did like the marketing with the silhouette and who is Dark Man? Hmm. 
Well, yeah, I know that you had Dark Man 2, Dark Man 3, and then they tried to do like a pilot, which I know my friend Mike, he loved that movie. Just go ask him, he'll tell how much he loved it. Yeah, then you had Dark Man 2, The Return of Durant, which somehow, some the fuck how, Durant is alive. He was in a coma, but he looks perfectly fucking fine. He only just got blown up in a fucking helicopter. But somehow he's alive and he looks perfectly normal. Because, you know, when you get blown up in helicopters, we all look perfectly fine and normal. Um, Sam Raimi was the your producer. But, yeah. Uh, Directed by Bradford May. Yeah, just... These directed video sequels are not for me. Just, you know, they don't have the budget behind them. They they just... Arnold Vaslu. I don't think he works as a star, I'm sorry. And it just doesn't have the style of Sam Raimi's films. Because you don't have the same director, of course. Kind of that weird thing he says, I know he likes Ricky, I mean, what is it, like some, something else going on we don't know about? Hey, Polly. Hey, Polly. And this sort of this, this turning of the screws where he's pretending to be other people and fucking them over. Uh, it's a smart idea. It's a pretty clever idea. I do like that. Yeah, pretty neat idea. I didn't meet the picture. What are you talking about? Yeah, they ain't, they ain't falling for that, Polly. Polly. You ain't got shit about it. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Really good stunt, I gotta say. A very good stunt on that. <laughs> I don't know why he would be sitting there though. Like why would he be sitting there? I mean I guess he's watching, but why would he be sitting out in the on the bench in broad daylight? Like you would think he'd be sitting somewhere in the dark or hiding in the alleyway watching from across the street. But yeah, I don't know why he'd be sitting there. Oh, I'm just sitting here twiddling my thumbs. Like, I, I don't know. I'm surprised the bad guys didn't see him when they went in. <laughs> uh, you became Dark Man. <laughs> what do you mean? We already know what you became, man. See, that's what happens. He fixes his face. He goes into service because he loves the killing. And then he gets a wife and a daughter and... Then she gets taken, and then he goes back to his urges. See, that's what people don't know. Darkman's the prequel to Taken. He just changed his name. He, he fixed his formula, um, changed his name, 
gone to the service. He learned it from his days of vigilanteism here. And then, uh, there you go. I'm telling you, it's prequel to Taken. I maintain that. <laughs> and this part makes the character interesting these fits of rage where he just becomes unreasonable and just unleashes but a lot of times he's sensible trying to work on his formula and then the stuff he can't control is for fun bits of uh, anger <laughs> I like the visually they kind of show that his brain is almost malfunctioning where you see those little bits of electrical going through. Gives people a visual stance as to what's really going on and why this is happening. For what I remember, it seems like in the sequels to Dark Man, he doesn't really have the rage fits anymore. Could be wrong on that. Which is stupid, that that's what makes the character a bit more interesting. It's like a little bit of the Hulk there, where you have these rage that is hard to control. It's like the man and monster fighting with each other within the soul of this one guy. Fuck, took 570 hours for that? That's shitload. Like 570 hours, how? What is that? Is that like... like that's almost a month, isn't it? Isn't that almost a month? Or like at least 20 days or something? It's a shitload of time. I think it's at least 20 days. 570 some hours. So it took 570 hours to get that one mask, so does that mean it takes that away for all the masks? Or I guess the first mask it takes, but then each time after it takes quicker time, I guess? Quicker time period? I guess, maybe, I don't know. I don't know shit about it. To be free, bitch. I'm Batman. No, I'm Dark Man. Nope, it can't be the same. Blame me up Shit Creek. You see that over there? It's called Shit Creek and you're up it. You're swimming up it and you're ready to drown of it. So, Shit Creek is real. Shit Creek is here. Shit Creek is in the vicinity. That's their opinion. Their opinion don't mean squat.
And yeah, I apologize for not being the most vocal. Because I, I didn't. I don't really riff on movies I like. <laughs> movies I hate. I'll just keep talking. Make fun of everything. Because I, I don't like the film. If I don't like the film, then I don't respect it. If I don't respect it, I'll just talk shit about it. But uh, other than a few little nitpicks, I, I don't have many issues with the film. Again, the main villain I'm not really big on. I'm much more into Larry Drake. And he doesn't have much screen time, Larry Drake, but he just makes a, a big impression. Just his demeanor and the lines he's given and the little... <laughs> and Larry Drake, even though he's a very cold, calcul you know, cold calculating villain, he's got a mean streak to him. He also has some unique things, like I think here he has finger collection. His little motifs he has from past dealings, I guess, you, as you put it. <laughs> there you go. And ladies too, he's got ladies in there too. Not just guys' fingers. So he's equal opportunity. I think there's black, white, man, woman. I never understood this aspect where he can make the voice. But how does he make the voice sound perfectly like someone? I mean, when did Darwin became a impressionist? You know, like you just sound kind of like him, but to sound perfectly like him. Again, that's one aspect I never really understood. I mean, could I do that? Like, if I, if I listen to, I don't know, Robin Williams, I'll, my voice will sound exactly like Robin Williams? <laughs> but you kind of have a fun idea to do that and on purpose and get people arrested. You do honestly do that for all the bad guys, honestly. But then he wants something a bit more in dealing with this. This part of me is like, well, what is his ultimate goal? If his ultimate goal is to kill, um, I guess maybe to find out who the head boss is. Maybe that's what it is. Is it maybe to get some money from these guys as well? Why? Well, in this whole dealing in was it Chinatown? Okay, Hong Kong. Is it to find out who's the higher up that's doing this to him? That killed him off? Tried to kill him off? Is it the get any finances to help with his reconstruction of? Tried to get his face fully fixed. I mean, Larry Drake just commands the screen each time he's on, on the screen. <laughs> and the fact that then he just take it out, and then the whole finale you left with some, this other guy, they like, we see what, in one scene? Who becomes the main bad guy so far? He's been in one scene in like the first hour? Purpose the other guys will look at like, wait, come on, man, there's no way he's going to take this. There's no way he's going to go along with this. <clears throat> I try to figure out what to do next. I 
Which is a, it's a nice role with Larry Drake having to, you know, you're playing yourself, but you're not really playing yourself. You're playing someone disguised as a dude, and the dude disguised as another dude. <laughs> Good thing he knows how to smoke too. Was Liam Neeson's tater? Was he a smoker? Spice is that coughing up. <laughs> That's the thing. You can't just put a smoke in and just be perfectly fine. Spice is that didn't choking. That's one of the few instances in the film which showcases he can't feel any pain. Which is that kind of a cool idea. There's other instances too, like the fact he gets the bolts in his hand and he's like, ah, it's like. Tch. But yeah, the movie made a little bit of money, but I did, it wasn't a whole lot. I mean, I did 40 million worldwide, and apparently the budget was about 14 million. So it probably made a little bit of profit, but it was a blockbuster to see the. Sequels go direct. The sequels went to direct to video because of that. And at this time, Universal was really getting to the direct to video market. That's why, yeah, like Tremors 2 went direct to video, the Dark Man sequels, other films. And this is pretty good effects. Like it really does seem like you have two Larry Drakes here. That was that was done fairly well. <laughs> Again, I don't know how Darman gets his voice that perfectly synced into it, but this stuff is pretty, pretty fun. They smacked him. Holy shit! Smacked the fuck out of him. Yeah, run! Get the fuck out of the way! God damn it! There you go. <laughs> yeah, of the villains, like Dan, Danny Hitch there, who was on the left, you really don't see him get killed. He disappears. Because this death scene was shot, but it was cut out. I forget Zally if he was like in his apartment and he was... Smashed in the wall or smashed in the ceiling or something to that effect. And I don't know, like the effect didn't work or something about it didn't work. So they cut the whole scene out. So his character just disappears. The the villain with the, the bum leg, with the machine gun leg. Yeah, this whole carnival scene again is a bit interesting with the the camera angles. <clears throat> yeah. This So 
Sorry, now I'm just watching the film. I need not do that. <laughs> the pink elephant scene has got to be one of my favorites just because... If you go into a film like this, you would never expect a scene like this. <laughs> you just, you never would expect it. With the, the way it's directed, the style, the dialogue. Take the fucking picture, elephant. <laughs> And this guy just being a fucking dickhead for no reason. Probably like a carnival. They don't really want you to give out the prizes. They want... That's why a lot... They want you to miss. Less prizes they give, the more money they get. <laughs> Even the weird shot, like the elephant itself turning towards him. Uh, yeah, that's a bad idea. I especially love how literal cracks, not only the, the cracks in his psyche, but literally you, you feel the crack. <laughs> I break the fingers like the bet the rubber fingers. I'm sure that was a rating issue. Like if you make them rubber, it won't get... <laughs> Dude, the fucking little fit. <laughs> I did how many comic book super movies do I have a line like take the fucking elephants? I did the way that all directed the tr actual scene of the cracks that may be too on the nose like he's cracking up and you literally see cracks, but it works for this kind of film. And again, the I'm, I'm sure the rubber finger thing is for a rating. I I would bet they wanted PG-13 for this originally. I could be wrong, but I would bet they wanted PG-13 because you don't really see a lot of violence as in gore compared to Sam Raimi's Evil Dead like you don't see the fingers actually get cut off you don't see people actually get hit like Ted Raimi you don't see him get hit by the car you don't see the the shootout you don't see bullet blood squibs again I, I would bet well make it PG-13 just Batman and other films of that nature was that but then I guess the MPA said, nope, it's rated R. Which other than that fuck word, why is this rated R? I think MPA, they thought it was too intense. Because really, this could be PG... If you release this today, it would be PG-13. It would. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. This would be PG-13. But then it would be deemed, I guess it was just deemed too intense. If Rosie McDormand does fine in the role, I mean, yeah, she does fine. I, I don't have much issues. I mean, apparently, like you said, Julie Roberts, Demi Moore was up for it. And those would have been interesting. But I said, I don't really have much issues with her. And of course, there's that little tragic love story aspect of it. Which room makes you feel for the character even more so? Okay, this is the second scene with this guy. I 
And maybe this, maybe that's what it is because he says such limited screen time or just the way the character's written. Because, you know, it's not, maybe it's not really the actor's fault because I wouldn't say he's given a bad performance. I can't say that. It's just his character just isn't that interesting. He seems like a nice business guy, so of course he's going to be the asshole later on. Later on, you f you know, you'll find out very quickly that he's with the bad guys. I think this is where she finds the coffee ring. Yeah, I think right here. Which I don't know why you would have that willy nilly right then and there. Like you would think you would have that, I don't know, in your desk or up your ass or somewhere else. But they'll just have it right there on the desk for her to find and see. Pretty fucking stupid of them. I mean, why would you just leave that there? Why don't you just, could just put it in the fucking desk? You have a fucking desk. You should just put it in there. Here's this document I don't want anyone to see. I'm going to put it right here. I'm going to put it right here. And you don't see it. If you're wondering, I'm typing to a few other people as I'm doing this. I'm sorry, I have to multitask. Only with the headphones. In order to know that they texted, I do have like an audio thing that go do. So, so yeah, I apologize for that. I did have to multitask. What I was done with was a. Uh, I wonder if that's done with map paintings in the back or model work with the unfinished buildings. I'm not 100% sure. Hmm. Not positive about that. I'm sure people out there will have to let me know. Yeah, sorry, I didn't say anything there. I mean, that's the scene speaks for itself. It showcases, yep, he's with the bad guys. <laughs> and yeah, you'll notice that Dan, Danny Hicks is nowhere to be found. The guy with the bum leg, the, the gun. Because just by this point...
And I guess with an action film, maybe people, if you're expecting wall-to-wall -wall action, it really doesn't. Like, if you're expecting a lot of fisticuffs, explosions, shootouts, it's not really that kind of a film. Although it is an action film, and this is a pretty good sequence. Very valid sequence. Like, look at that, it's a great explosion, and good job with the, the stop man. Especially here, like, avoiding all these explosions on the rooftop. Pretty damn cool. Pretty badass. And good job to the, the stunt people. As well as the, the explosive techs. And look at that, real helicopter being used. Not CG. Definitely what the big action set piece of the movie. <laughs> And I will say Sam Raimi handled these action scenes fairly well. I'm understanding the location and some really cool practical explosions. Uh, exciting fun scene. Because there's this bit, then the bit where he's hanging from the helicopter. Yeah, I apologize on multitasking. It's the best I can do. And yeah, I love the the push-ins and all the different... I forget what that's called when you have it to the side, the different angles. <laughs> now I'm just sitting there enjoying the action scenes. I apologize. Him dropping down like... This is kind of a scene you would see in films like Mission Impossible 2, like they kill someone and it's actually someone in a mask and they release it, someone duct tape. Again, you think it's the person they get shot and then they really reveal is the duct tape on I think like Mission Impossible 2 and other films have done that, so kinda of did it here first. <laughs> Ooh, nice. <laughs> Definitely showcases his superhuman strength in this scene. Just throwing him around like a rad doll. <laughs> so what did he do? Did he stop off to get his fake face to put it on and then get to the helicopter? I guess maybe. 
Or maybe you want to just have one more backup since he knew to go blow this place up. And I told you that little bird thing is going to come back later on. Yeah, you get to the other big scene in the movie. I guess that's sort of the point. It's like Sam Raimi do, hey, I know it's not a lot of action. When when it does, it's going to be a fairly elongated elongated scene. With the, hell, with the rooftop explosion stuff. Hunting some people down there. And now this scene here. Yeah, they ain't gonna work. <laughs> Kaboom. Kabob, bitch. <laughs> Kaboom. Get the fuck out of here with that shit. <laughs> Kiss my ass, sea bass. <laughs> Shake them, fuck that shit. Fuck that shit. <laughs> Sons of bitches. <laughs> and there's some really good stunt work in this scene too. I mean, look at all that. Hang that fucking high up. Yeah, some of the shots where you tell it's, I don't know what you call it, green screen. Maybe that's the best way to put it. But these shots here are beautiful. I mean, that's a real guy hanging from a helicopter, going around, swinging around. And of course, yeah, some of the up close is altered, but that's still a real helicopter going among real buildings. And there's a guy hang, hanging from there. It's pretty damn impressive. It's like, we gotta have something to really impress people. You know, after seeing films like Batman and, and more. <laughs> I need to get these beautiful wide shots of this. And yeah, the up close of Liam Neeson... Because you're not going to have actual Liam Neeson hanging from the helicopter. So it's not the best... I did green screen or such, but it is what it is. It's still interspersed to a lot of really solid practical stuff. And these these POV shots where the camera is almost hitting these trucks, that also makes me go, how the hell do they get these shots? Like they have the camera really in between all these vehicles. Like I'm gonna go the opposite way. Motorcycles here, cars over here. Pretty damn impressive. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not saying any much. I'm just impressed by the, the action scenes. And you need real explosions, you have real cars flipping over, a real person. Okay. And funny enough, this is kind of what happened in the first Mission Possible on the train, where Tom Cruise hooked the helicopter chain to the train. Only this is the something else. Now how the hell did Durant survive this? Look at this. Boom. That helicopter became a fireball. There is nothing left. But somehow Durant fell, got into a coma, and his face is perfectly fine. His body is fine. Get the fuck out of here. Dark man too. And that's the thing. is like... Okay, if somehow Durant, as silly as it is jumped off and like he's coming off a bridge somehow he jumped off or I don't know he's passed by something he jumps off the helicopter but the rest of it 
but I don't know. It's a comic book movie, so you're not dealing with reality, but you gotta give me a little something movie. And that's kind of... I do like the ending. I like the fact that it's all on top of here. And this not totally constructed building. It's just... This villain didn't really do much for me. I mean, uh, I'm more indifferent than horrible. It's uh, indifference. I'm very indifferent to this guy. <clears throat> I guess that's the point is that this bad guy is cool with heights but our hero isn't. Which I don't mind the idea, and as the camera work showcases here, not only you don't fall to your death, but you could be impaled as well. Right, I don't think the impaling's gonna matter if you fall from that high, but hey. Put like a Mortal Kombat death trap down below, sure. Sorry, now I'm just listening to the guy. It's been a while since I've seen the film. <laughs> I mean, the, the guy's not doing a bad job acting in this scene. You, I built it all. It's just, this is what, maybe the third scene now we've seen him in? This is the first scene he's introduced, the second scene with the coffee ring is found, the document. And this is like the third scene, isn't it? So, it's kind of hard, like, okay, here's your main villain. We've seen him for like, third time now. The guy we've been following through is dead, so it's like, eh. Okay, whatever. <clears throat> and it makes me go also, like, why is Darman having such a problem with this guy when fighting them? And this is definitely a whole scenario you would see in comic books, variety of comic books, so it does capture that feel to it, most definitely, which is what Sam Raimi is, is, was going for. Also, I'm very curious, like, Sam Raimi is that to produce the Dark Band sequels, and the ending has Bruce Campbell's face. Why didn't they get Bruce Campbell for the direct -to video movies? Like, Bruce Campbell starring in Dark Man 2 and 3? That might have made it a bit more interesting. But I'm surprised why they didn't. Like, why didn't you just get Bruce Campbell... Again, Bruce Campbell would have taken the job. I mean, Bruce Campbell did fucking... Look at some of the roles Bruce Campbell's taken. He, he would take the job. I mean, he's taking what... Feels like Alien Apocalypse or whatever the hell it was called and some other shit. So yeah, someone's gonna have to ask me that. Why was that not the case? Did no one ask? 
that's a pretty cool looking bolt gun. I like to use that for like a horror movie or an action film. Again, very cool looking bolt gun. It really does look like a rifle. That's the wrong way to... <laughs> That's pretty satisfying. We beast the ever-loving fuck out of him. With that, with that hallucination, it's weird because it focuses in and immediately focuses out. I wonder if there's something more into that. Like something more into... There's going to be other images... Because most all the other times when it focuses in, it'll go to this like, little crazy montage of designs. And this is just in and out. I wonder if there's something more to it. <laughs> Remember I promised I killed you last? I lied. No, he wouldn't. He's killed like three, four other people. At least. How the hell do you know him? You, you Have you ever met him? Idiot. Guy's killed like a bunch of people so far. Really cool art uh, makeup, I gotta say. Especially we're showing the teeth. That praise doesn't get mentioned a lot, but you know, definite praise for the makeup for the face. Yeah. Almost looks like Darth Vader at the end of Return of the Jedi after the helm is taken off. Sorry, now I'm listening to it. I think. He gives a good speech here. Not only is he damaged goods on the outside, he's damaged goods on the inside. I wonder if nowadays with reconstructive surgery you could fix that. Right, you may look a little bit like bolt toss it. You know, fish lips and shit, but maybe. <clears throat> maybe one day. Not anytime soon, but maybe one day. So it was nighttime, I think as soon as he comes out, it was daytime. At least we wonder, like, the master Bruce Campbell, who the hell did that come from? Like, he must have made these masks based on people. So who the hell was Bruce Campbell's face from? Because we've never seen that character before. They just could get out of a, a book? A magazine? He looks good. I mean, it's cool to have Bruce Campbell make a cameo, but... Yeah, it makes me wonder how the hell did he... Where the hell did that face come from? I just has the feel that he, technically he... Don't, Look like anybody. But it's a shame. Like Bruce Campbell. Just from that look. He could have made like a good. Lead. In a comic book movie. He got this close to the Phantom. But Billy Zane got it. But um, And that's Dark Man. Which went on to sequels. Which again, I don't know why they didn't get Bruce Campbell for the sequels then. Instead they got Otto Vosloo. Whatever. 
And Liam Neeson's like, nah, I did my share of 18 hours, you know, putting the shit on. Uh, I'm, I'm good. Yeah, Danny Hitch, his terror disappeared. Ted, Ted Raimi. Um, let's see. Nicholas Worth as Paul. He was the bald guy. He was the guy in West Craven Swamp Thing. Oh, yeah, John Landis is one of the people in the hospital. Well, fuck John Landis. Well, Scott Speedle was one of the people on the docks. Okay. A final shimp. Bruce Tambell, shimp. Of course, shimp from the Three Stooges because... I just to explain as I ended what that means by final shimp. In the Three Stooges, when shimp passed away, they still had to finish scenes without him. So they got various people and they would shoot him in the back. Or, honestly, let me take that back. There were times where they would use old footage to make new shorts. But they needed things to link together with Shemp, but he passed away. So they got like a fake sh person with similar haircut. They filmed from the side, they filmed from the back in order to plug those scenes in. Thus, fake Shemp. And in the credits of like the Evil Dead films, you would see fake shimps. Uh, and that's what it led to where someone played, you know, plugged in there for a tiny bit. And the ship, I guess, this little nod to, to that. Just the character doesn't really have a name. And I, yeah, I don't know where that face came from, but. It, sorry, Bruce, you can't be the lead, but here's a little consolation prize. But with that said, I like Dark Man. I like the style. Liam Neeson gives a really good performance, as does Larry Drake. Danny Elfman's score is fairly solid. Definitely has that horror universal feel to it. The style goes a long way. It's not wall-to-wall -wall action. But when the action's there in the third act, it's pretty fun. Sad that Larry Drake got taken out and you have this other guy's the villain, which I didn't care one way or another. I think if Larry Drake was there, that would have been more effective. Because it would have been... This... I mean, I know this is a over-the-top thing, but imagine Batman, you had Joker, 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 Joker dies, and then... Bob or someone else, he's the, the main villain at the end. It's like, what? Okay. See, that's what I mean. It's like, eh. That's just my opinion. But overall, still really enjoy the film. So, with that said, thanks for watching. Take care. We'll see you guys later. Bye-bye.